Good morning. The littles will be with us today. Am I on? All right, there we go. Hey, there we go. Okay, thank you. Well, the littles will be with us this morning as it's the first Sunday of the month. And uh, the idea there is to continually teach the littles how to be in church, right? And to continue to learn how to uh, be a part of adult church. And so the first and fifth Sundays, we... Uh, have them in with us, which is always a blessing to have them with us, and uh, we're always ex- excited for them to be in service with us. Amen. Uh, speaking of the littles, um, we're going to do we're going to start something new um, starting uh, in June on fifth Sundays, and what we're going to do, um, I've shared this with with uh, Pastor Justin and the children's leaders, and and what we're going to do. On the fifth Sundays in the morning is have a youth slash children's service where they run the service for uh, the first part. The kids are really excited to teach you some of the hand motions they have for some of our worship songs. And uh, one of the youth will lead a devotion, 10, 15 minute devotion for you. And so it'll be really exciting. We're going to start that in June. And uh, so I'm pretty excited for that. And I I know uh, Pastor Justin and Ryan and Carrie are pretty excited for that as well. Um, so be in prayer for that. And um, I, I just want to share, before I get to the prayer time, I just want to share um, a praise with you. Um, I think it, it, I'm clear to share this now. Um, so in the last three weeks, through the ministry and the people of this church, we've had six littles, um, children, accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Yes. So, of course, everybody knows Braley a few weeks ago, and uh, then last Sunday, it was last Sunday, right, Tamara? Uh, Tamara's message of me, and uh, and she got to share, and then I think she posted on online as well, and uh, she led one of her girls and two nieces to salvation, uh, so that was four, and then yesterday at Spring Rally, two more decided they needed Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Yeah. Amen? So we have... Um, I, I, it's in your bulletin, a date in April scheduled for Baptism Sunday. We're just going to celebrate <laughs> with baptisms. Um, and so uh, that's in your bulletin. If that date doesn't work for anybody needing baptized, let me know. We'll reschedule uh, for a little bit later in April. But I want to make sure that, you know, we can just celebrate all these at once and, and just celebrate what Jesus is doing in our midst. Amen. Uh, what's that? Oh, okay, sorry, it's not in there, um, but I think it's like April 14th, maybe. Um, I think somewhere right in there. If that doesn't work, um, let me know. Just come see me and, and let me know, and we'll, we'll work it out. Uh, let me get to our prayer time real quick. Uh, baby Nolan, um, just a little little baby, um, and, and he's got some serious health issues, uh, so please be in prayer for baby Nolan. Uh, Joe and Connie, uh, Joe's going to be in the hospital till at least March 5th. Um, so please pray for Big Joe. Uh, the Fla- Flanagan family with the loss of uh, Jimmy Flanagan. And uh, Brayley is not feeling well this morning. Uh, Julie Eaton is having surgery. Uh, Jen Palmer. Scott and Alicia, and we did get an update on Scott um, earlier today. It looks like he'll probably be in there through tomorrow. Um, so drainage of the wound is not quite what they want it to be. So it looks like probably through tomorrow at least, uh, before he'll get to come home. Uh, Taylor Willison, Helen Keith for health issues, and of course our mission trip coming up. Uh, Paxton Boyles, and these will be added to your bulletin, so next week you'll have them in there that you can uh, go through all those prayer requests. And um, we're going we're gonna to jump in this morning. We finished last week, uh, the year of Jubilee, in... And we're going to recap that for you, and we're going to see if this morning's message goes hand in hand with what God is calling us in this year of Jubilee to do. And so um, as we get started, we're going to jump in uh, Matthew 28, if you have your Bibles uh, handy this morning. It will be on screen, but i just like to encourage everybody to uh, you know, use your Bibles if you have one. If you don't, there's some in the pew. Take it with you. You can have it. We'll replace them. Um, if, you ha- if you know somebody who needs a Bible, 
Grab one of the ones in the pew and give it to them. That's okay. We'll replace them. Getting out the Word of God is uh, of the utmost importance. So don't ever worry about taking a Bible out of the pew. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> All right, so Matthew 28. We're going to be reading 18 through 20. So if you're physically able this morning, we just invite you and encourage you to stand uh, for the reading and hearing of God's Holy Word today as we show reverence and respect for God and His Word uh, this morning. And this, this morning's message is titled, Are You Commissioned? All right. Oh, I guess I have the Year of Jubilee recap to begin with. So hang tight. Preach the gospel to the poor. Heal the brokenhearted. Proclaim liberty to the captives. Bring recovery of sight to the blind. Set at liberty the oppressed. And proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That is what the church is supposed to do. These are the ministry opportunities that the church of Jesus should have because this is what Jesus came to do. He told us in Luke 4 and He was fulfilling the prophecy in Isaiah 61. And so as we read through Matthew 28 and we get into this message, I want you to remember these. Take a picture of it if you need to and um, see if what we're, we're going to talk about this morning fulfills what the year of Jubilee is all about. So out of Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we love you today. We bless you today. We thank you today for your holy word. Father, we thank you for this year of Jubilee and the fruit that we've already been seeing out of this, Father. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, we proclaim today is a day that we are going to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. We are going to declare the year of Jubilee as a year dedicated to you, Yahweh. We're going to proclaim today that your word will go out and accomplish exactly what you send it out to accomplish, Lord. We're going to declare today that the Holy Spirit is going to set the oppressed free. We're going to declare today that blind will see again. We're going to declare today that the hungry will be fed. We're going to declare today that the thirsty will be given drink. We're going, to be, we're going to declare today that the Holy Spirit is going to fall on this place, flood this place, fill your children in here today and those listening online. And Father, in the name of Jesus, let Your Word do exactly what You want. Anoint me from on high, from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Fill me now, preach through me now, and let Your will and Your Word go in the hearts and minds of every believer and accomplish exactly what You want. And if there's any unsaved under my voice, let today be the day of salvation. And all of God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. So, I was praying throughout the week, Lord, what am I supposed to preach? We just finished the year of Jubilee. I'm leaving in a week. What am I, what am I supposed to preach, Lord? And... The Lord laid it on my heart pretty heavy to preach about the call to serve Jesus' kingdom. And so that's this morning's message. It's all about Jesus' kingdom and your call, my call, our call together to build Yahweh's kingdom. And... The title of this morning's message is a question. And so I pose the question to you today. Are you commissioned? And, and some of you may go, well, you know, you guys, Pastor Casey and Pastor Justin, and, and, and some of you are going on this trip for two weeks, so you're commissioned. But maybe not me. Maybe I'm not commissioned. I'm not supposed to go to Kenya. I'm not supposed to go to Dominican Republic next year. I'm not supposed to do this. I'm not commissioned. 
And so I pose the question to you today. Are you commissioned? And, and if your answer has been initially no, not me, by the end of this message, my prayer is that you will have heard the Holy Spirit speak to your heart and to your mind and to your soul, and you will have a resounding yes as you leave this service today. And as we talk about serving the kingdom of Jesus, therefore we wrestle with the call of being commissioned to God's service. And it's easy to think, well, pastors are commissioned. Sunday school teachers are commissioned. Missionaries are commissioned. But I'm just a Christian. I'm not commissioned pastor. And so my, my heartfelt prayer is that you will truly, genuinely wrestle in your heart and mind with this question, am I commissioned and called to God's service? Because the answer to that question will direct the remainder of 2024 for this church. you got to understand this. We've been talking about the year of Jubilee, and the whole point of the year of Jubilee is a year of rest, and a year of restoration, a year of rejuvenation, a year of renewal, a, re a year of recommitment, a year of rededication, a year of God redoing what we've been doing and the way we've been doing it. And so we've learned for two months what the year of Jubilee is. And now this sermon... Are you called to God's service? Will dictate if we fulfill the year of Jubilee. You see, because if you notice, the entire year of Jubilee was about doing what? God's work, right? It was about doing Jesus' work the way Jesus did the work. It's no longer about our kingdom and doing what we think is right, the way we want to do it, but now it's about getting in line with what God is doing and the way He's doing it. And so, the question is, are you commissioned? And the wrestle that you should have today Am I called to God's service? Am I called to something bigger than myself? Because I, I, I'm going to say this, and, and I hope you don't get offended by it. Okay, I love you when I say this. Understand that. But there's nobody in this congregation that's very important. I, I hope you understand that. There's nobody here that the fate of nuclear Armageddon rests on our shoulders. Amen. There's nobody in our congregation that, that the, a country is going to get nuked off the planet if we make the wrong decision. There's nobody in our congregation that a million people are going to go hungry and starve and die if we don't make the right decision, right? So in the worldly perspective, we're really not that important. We go to our jobs if we, if we still work. We... we Fulfill an eight, seven, six, nine hour day, whatever it is. We go home to, to our houses. We go to sleep and we do it again, right? The, the, the globe is not being impacted by what we do in our lives. You go, Pastor, this isn't a very encouraging message. What are you doing? If we're going to understand what God is calling us to, we've got to understand our perspective in life. And, and if we think that we're pretty important, guess what, friends? We've thought way too highly of ourselves. I'm included in this boat. We're all in this together. And so w the point is this. God is calling you to something. God is calling me and us together to something so big, 
so impactful that if it were up to us in our lives, we could never do it. But God is calling you to His service and wants to use you in ways that you can't even imagine. Yes, you better praise God. Because if we do our lives, nothing. But if we do God's lives, some pretty big stuff is going to happen. And that's the point I want us to understand is that if you'll lean into what God wants to do in your life, if you'll lean in to the impact, the influence, the change and transformation that God wants to do in your life and through you, you're going to change this world. And you might not be sitting in the Oval Office and you might not be a leader of a nation. And you might not be a leader of a Fortune 500 company. And you might not have six zeros at the end of your bank account. But you can accomplish more to impact eternal differences than any of those people combined. Amen? Amen. And y'all need to get it right now that if we choose to step up and accept the commissioning on our lives... For God's service, people are going to talk about you. People are going to write about you. People are going to say good things about you. And, and I'm not talking the negative. Let, listen, listen. I don't care what the negatives have to say. Negative people are going to be negative. A, a phrase of today, haters are going to what? <laughs> Amen? Haters are going to hate. But guess what? You're going to have angels talking about you. You're going to have the Holy Spirit talking about you. You're going to have Jesus talking about you. You're going to have other churches talking about Look at what them people are doing. They're crazy for Jesus. Yeah. yeah. I, let the haters hate. Who cares? Amen. Amen. Oh, whew, none of that's in my notes. <laughs> oh, golly, Ned's alive. Holy Spirit, come. Whoa, what are we, whoa! <laughs> I'm done. a sermon ever. Done. I'm done. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. Shall I click or shall you click? I can try. Everybody hold your breath. Did you end up having to click? No? Okay. <laughs> oh, my golly. Okay, so the Great Commission. Oh, I love the Lord's sense of humor. Isn't it great? Oh, in Matthew uh, 28, and, and 20, uh, 28, 19, and 20, we learn what's called the Great Commission. And this has become known as the Great Commission. It's not, it doesn't say that. But anybody ever heard the word uh, great before in your lives? Yeah, we've all heard the word great, right? Just out of curiosity, what do you think, and if you read that screen already, don't answer, what do you think the definition of great means? Awesome, okay. Big, amazing, powerful, okay, great. Whew. Glad two of the three of you answered the way I, I thought as well. Because when I hear the word great, I think, man, that's great. That's awesome, right? That's amazing. That's wonderful. That's great, right? So I thought I was thinking about the Great Commission. I'm like, all right, why is it called the Great Commission? Like, why did it become known as the Great Commission? Because if you, if you add the words, I think, the amazing commission. The amazing, awesome commission, right? Well, that's fitting, 
But I had to look it up. And here's what the word great means. Very large in size, extent, or intensity. Of a larger size than other. Similar forms. Large in quantity or number. The word great is a numerical word. It has to do with size. Did anybody else besides Lisa know that? I didn't. I looked that definition up and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I had no clue. So, okay, so that makes sense. Large in size, extent, or intensity. Now we can start to understand why 500 years ago they started calling it the Great Commission. Because 500 years ago, the word meant exactly what the definition says, right? We've changed it over time, like with many words. Um, let, let, let me just give you an example of a word that's gotten changed over time. Um, okay, if I say the word bad, what do you think of? Besides them two, because they know where I'm going with it. Something horrible, right? When I was a teenager, we would say, man, that's bad. That's awesome. You know what I'm talking about? And now if I tell the kids that's bad, they're like, that's bad. Not good. So words change meaning over time. 500 years, of work, 500 years ago, the word great meant this right here. All right, so now... Uh, what does the word commission mean? Is this something you get when you sell something? It is. It is, right? Yeah. So, so that's what I think of, right? When I hear the word commission, like, hey, I just sold a car and I got a commission, right? I'm not a car salesman, but if I was, that's what would happen. So what does the word commission mean? If, if we all, did anybody think of anything different for commission? Okay, okay, what'd you think of, Brenda? Commission to do a job, okay, all right, very good. Let's check this out. So commission is the act of granting certain powers or the authority to carry out a particular task or duty. The authority so granted, the matter or task so authorized. Where do we get... If you sell a car, you get a commission out of that. I don't know the answer, but this is the definition of the word commission. So, the act of granting certain powers or the authority to carry out a particular task or duty. So, a very large in size, extent, or intensity, and the act of granting certain powers or authority. Now, does this start to Can you start to see where I'm going now? Can you start to see the road, the vision being laid out of where we're going with this? Yeah? Oh, you guys are good. You guys make this so much easier. I hope you know that. Check this out. As we start to look at the passage, we read 19 and 20, right? Matthew 28, 19 and 20. I intentionally left out verse 18. But you should not leave out 18. Whenever you hear about the Great Commission, you always hear 19 and 20, right? Whenever you hear, read, or, or heard preached about, verses 19 and 20 is what you hear. But please do not leave out verse 18. This is essential. Check this out. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So he says, he's setting a tone for you. All authority is given to me. Now you go. Isn't that neat? When you, when you learn the definition of commission, you learn that it's a, the act of giving someone else power and authority. I'm going away for three weeks. For this mission trip, I'll be, I'll be missing three Sundays. I am handing over the power and authority of the leadership of this church for three weeks to Davin while I am away to handle the preaching of the 
Sunday mornings. I'm handing that over. I'm granting that authority. That that ability for Him to stand in my stead while I go do the work across the globe. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about, I've been given power and authority, now I'm going to give it to you. Isn't that cool? So, what what do you think of when you think of the word power and authority? Having full power and authority. We don't have it in our country, but a lot of countries are run by what? Kings, right? Kings. Well, if Jesus is talking about building His kingdom, and Scripture teaches us that He's the what? King of kings. And He's saying, I have all power and authority, now I'm giving it to you. It is a king granting authority and power to do His work. So, let's let's break down verse 19 and 20 as we look at this great commission. So, He says, Go therefore, in verse 19, right, He says, All authority and power has been given to Me under heaven and earth. Go therefore. Now, what is the word Therefore, we know what go is, right? What is go? Go. I'm not, I'm not tricking you. I'm not setting you up for anything. The word go is go. But there's this word therefore. It's an interesting word. It's, a, it's an interesting word. And they go hand in hand. And it's an adverb. And it means this, for that purpose, referring to something already stated, for that reason or cause. So go therefore is one word in the Greek. And it's saying, because of what I just told you, do that. So when you say therefore, don't you normally use it as a conjunction word? I'm not feeling well, therefore I'm going to go stay, or I'm going to stay home. Does that make sense? That's a conjunction word that puts two thoughts together and, 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 and puts them in a complete thought, right? The word therefore means it's predicated on the word before it. So the whole thought, you can go, you can make disciples, you can teach the nations because of what I just told you. Jesus says, because I have power and authority, that's the reason You can do this. Not because we're just normal people on the street. Because if it's up to us, nothing's going to happen. Amen? Amen. But because of Jesus' power and authority. This is your identity. Friends, you need to understand. Stop looking at yourself as mom and dad. Stop looking at yourself as uh, brother or sister. Stop looking at yourself as son or daughter. Stop looking at yourself as those things in the worldly system. Start looking at yourself. If you're born again as a prince or a princess to the King of Kings. For that reason, go. For that reason, go. And do what? Make disciples. This is the only direct command in this passage in the original Greek. This is amazing. We read this in English and we've got go, make disciples, teach the nations, and baptize them. In English, we have four direct commands, right? But in the original Greek, there's only three direct, or three indirect, one direct. The only direct command is make disciples. Your command, what Jesus is telling you, your first and primary command, your first and primary mission, if you should choose to accept it, is to make disciples. 
It's not to make a name for yourself. It's not to build your kingdom. It's not to get rich. It's not to be a boss at work. It's not to do this. It's not your job. If you're a Christian, your job is to make disciples. So we need to define what is disciples. A disciple is a baptized follower of Jesus. So here's the thing. It's not enough to get people saved. That's awesome. And that's the very first step. The next step after they get saved is they become followers. A follower of Jesus is a disciple. If you're following Jesus, you're a disciple. Did you know that? Here's another identity thing. So not only are you a prince or a princess if you're saved, but if you're following Jesus, now you're a disciple of Jesus. You see, the world is... Why do I bring up the identity thing? The world wants to tell us we're stupid. The world wants to tell us we're no good. The world wants to tell us we're laden in debt. The world wants to tell us we're, we're ugly, we're skinny, we're fat, we're dumb, we're smart. The world wants to give us all these labels, right? Well, I'm trying to give you some identity things that, that can change how you see yourself. You're a prince or a princess if you're saved. You're, if you're following Jesus... You're a disciple of the King. You're a follower of Jesus. Now some, Jesus may be way up here and you're following from a distance. Some might be midway following closer. And some might be right there that when Jesus stops, you're bumping into Him because you're so close. And my goal for you is that this whole church Are those up there so close to Jesus that when He stops, we go, Sorry, Jesus. Didn't mean to bump you. I'm going to stop now because you stopped. You're going, I'm going to go. You're taking a right, I'm going to take a right. You're taking a left, I'm going to go left. You're stopping, I'm stopping. But see, what we've done as a church is Jesus was over here stopped and we just kept going. We just kept going. He, He started moving and we stopped. He took a left and we took a right. He took a right and we took a what? Left. But in this year of Jubilee, we have refocused and reset how we're doing ministry. And guess what? We are starting to see amazing fruit with worship, with salvations, with the joy and the Holy Spirit's presence in this place. Amen? Amen? And so we've got to be disciples so we can make disciples. And this is the only direct command. Go, baptize, and teach are all indirect commands. We do those after we make disciples. You make disciples and you do that by going. You make disciples by baptizing, you make the disciples by teaching, you do the disciple making by these things. It's like this. If I'm going to go to Kenya, I'm going to go by way of airplane. Make sense? I'm going, but I'm going by airplane. We're going to make disciples By going. We're going to make disciples by teaching about Jesus. We're going to make disciples by baptizing. Baptism is actually pretty significant and important. If you're saved and you're born again and you've never been baptized, here in a few weeks, a month, we're going to do a baptism service. Yeah, I say say, let's baptize you. If you're born again, don't hold back. It's important, it's significant. If you're a follower, the word disciple literally means a baptized follower of Jesus. All right, so go into all nations. Now, this great commissioning, who was Jesus telling this to when he said this in Matthew 28? 
Was it like just a certain group of Christians? Do you read this in Matthew 28 and go, well, that was really only the early church. Anybody read it that way? So when you read this, who's this for? All believers. Going to all nations, right? Go. We're called to go into the entire world. Make converts, make disciples, make Christians. It takes sacrifice to do this, friends. It takes a dying of self. It takes a dying of my wants, my desires, my kingdom building to do this. Because you gotta, you got to sacrifice so much to do this. This is a lot of work. It's worth it. Oh, my heavens, it's worth it. But it's sacrifice. He keeps on. He says, baptize. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Did you know there are at least two baptisms spoken of in the New Testament? Did you all know that? When you hear baptism, what do you normally think of? Water, right? But there's actually another way that we're going to talk about and the reason, well, well, let's do first, the physical. Physical baptism, just like we saw a few weeks ago. Romans 6, 3 and 4. Do, do, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through the baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live. A new life. Baptism, physical baptism, is an outward expression of an inward and spiritual grace. What God has done in our hearts, we make manifest outwardly through the physical waters of baptism. Because I've been baptized. We broke the ice. It was 32 degrees. I was baptized. And it says, we're baptized into His death. Uh, I'm still alive. So it must be Symbolism here, right? Right? So it's an, in, it's an outward showing of what God's done inside of you. If you've never been physically baptized and you're born again, please, it's important. It's significant. You should be baptized. Don't let fear hold you back. Don't let this or that. Do not let anything stop you from being baptized because God wants you to show the world that Jesus is in your heart. Now, the second baptism that we're going to talk about this morning is the reason many Baptists sit and, and stand and, and just kind of never really get into worship. The reason many Baptists and, and many Methodists and many um, of your more um, conservative, thank you, um, denominations... Don't really let go is because you've never really been baptized into the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to get into some really deep theological... I'm not going to get into some deep theological stuff. I could, but I'm not going to. Because this could, this could splinter a thousand ways and we're not going to do it. For all intents and purposes this morning, the reason many of us in here have never really let go is because pride has kept us from letting go and being baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now, baptism in the Holy Spirit and fire. The, you could see these as two separate, so three baptisms. Baptism in physical, baptism in the Spirit, and baptism in fire. I've got them labeled as one because they're usually together. But check this out. Luke 3.16, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Amen. Now, what does that mean? That's a verse many of you have read. That's a verse you've heard preached about. But you don't really even know what that means. Amen? 
What does that mean? Well, let me unpack this a little bit. I'm not going to go real deep. I'm not going to get really theological on you. But I'm going to unpack this a little bit so you have a greater understanding of what was meant here. That Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The word baptize in Greek is baptizo. And it literally means immersion. That's all the word means. If you're going to do your dishes and you were speaking in Greek, you would say, I baptizo my dishes. You dunk them in the water and wash them, right? You make sure they go into that soapy water. That's, the, that's what baptism means. It means you're going into the water. So, the word used here is the same exact word. You will be immersed in the Holy Spirit and you will be immersed in fire. Now, if the Holy Spirit is in charge of your life and you're immersed in the Holy Spirit, you're going to let go. And you're going to use the, the spiritual gifts, the Holy Spirit gifts. You wonder why you're holding back? You wonder why the Holy Spirit's not working in you? You wonder why? Because you've never let go and been immersed in the Holy Ghost. Now, I view this differently than being filled with the Holy Ghost. It, it's subtle, but it's slightly different in my estimation. Because when you're filled with the Holy Spirit is when you get saved. When you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you. Jesus said, I'll send you a helper. He'll teach you all things. He'll comfort you. He'll help you. He'll give you the words when you don't know what to say. That's the Holy Spirit living inside of you. There's a difference in the Holy Spirit living inside of you and the Holy Spirit immersing you. You can be filled with the Holy Ghost but still quenching the Holy Ghost in your life. And when you quench the Holy Spirit, you say, you keep going Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, I'm just, I'm just using King James on you. King James says Holy Ghost, newer translations say Holy Spirit. Same thing, means same thing. When you're immersed in the Holy Spirit, you're going to hear the voice of God. You're going to see God. You're going to know things. You're going to hear things. You're going to be able to use the spiritual gifts that God has given you. And you wonder why you don't lead people to salvation. You wonder why you don't use the spiritual gifts. It is because your pride has kept you from letting go in the presence of Yahweh and being immersed in the Holy Ghost. And, there, and, and let, me, let me just add this. You can, you can absolutely today be immersed and baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire, and then tomorrow you wake up and you just quench the Spirit in your life, and you are no longer baptized in the Spirit and fire. I see this as part of the sanctification process, that as you continually become more like Christ, you continually become less like self, and when you become more like Christ you learn to let go and be immersed in the Spirit and in fire. Does that make sense? You can see somebody who's on fire for Jesus and immersed in the Holy Ghost. And I'm not talking about speaking in tongues and things like that. That might be a gift you have. But then again, it might not be. You can tell someone who holds back and doesn't let the Spirit of God work in them. You can tell someone who's in control of their life and not the Holy Spirit. You can tell someone who only clings to the Word of God, but not the Holy Spirit. You can tell someone who walks in self, but not Holy Ghost. And this church is full of them. We have so many people in this church that will not let go and let the Holy Spirit control our lives. And it is essential, essential that you gain this understanding of what being baptized in the Spirit and fire means and then allowing God to do it in your life. For many of you, this will look like you going into a quiet place, turning on some worship songs. Don't go in there with your spouse. Don't go in there with your kids. You need time alone at the throne of God. And lay your face down. I mean lay down on the ground 
with your face in the ground. It might hurt. It's worth it. And you turn on some worship songs and you clear your mind and you absolutely just let go of self and be immersed in the presence of Yahweh and the Holy Ghost and you watch transformation overtake your life. You cannot be immersed in the Holy Ghost and never had a throne room experience. I don't believe it. I don't believe you can be immersed, baptized in the Spirit and fire, and never been in the throne room of Yahweh. I don't believe it's possible. And the reason many of you have never done it is because you've never really went to the throne of God. You've been on the coattails of someone else. You've been on the, the experiences of other people. You've never made the time and the effort and the commitment to get on your face with Jesus. And let me tell you something. You do it, and you come tell us the experience that you're going you're gonna to go through. It will be life transforming. And it needs to continue. Don't do it one time and be like, yep, I'm good now. Because guess what? The world and the devil keeps, keeps come knocking. Amen? You need to keep going to the throne. You need to keep going to Yahweh. You need to keep being immersed in the Holy Ghost. So we read this, us Baptists. We read this and we're like, hey, I'm just going to dunk somebody. Yay! And that's great. And that's awesome. And we should do that. Praise God. Yes! And we celebrate. But there's more to it. There's some more to it. But you got to be willing to die to self. And then we teach the converts to obey everything Jesus has commanded. Friends, I'm just going to ask you, are you obeying everything Jesus commands? Don't answer me. Because if you say yes, I love you, but you're lying to yourself. There is none of us that are following every command. We're trying, and we're getting better, Amen. And so we need to be honest and transparent with people. Listen, I want you to get saved. I want you to be baptized. I want to teach you about Jesus. But this is going to be hard. We're going to mess up, but we'll mess up and we'll help each other and we'll get through this. We need to give grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy, and be there as we teach the world about Jesus. Amen. And so I'm going to just put the Great Commission in my words the very large in size, number, and intensity of Jesus granting us power and authority to make disciples by going, by baptizing, and by teaching the world all that He commands. Is that a pretty cool definition of the Great Commission? That, in, that is my words taking the definitions and the Scripture and putting it together to something that makes sense in my mind. Does that make sense to you guys? So, we already decided this isn't just for preachers. This isn't just for select people. But this is anybody who claims the name of Jesus. Amen? So, the question now is, where to? Where do we go now? Well, that answer is in Acts 1, 4 through 8. Anybody read this before? Okay. Let's read this and see what, what, what we're told here. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have not heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the what? The Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive, the Holy, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem in all of Judea, in Samaria, and what? To the ends of the earth. All right. So we saw we're commissioned to go spread the news of Jesus. 
Now the question is, where to? And we're answering that in Acts 1, 4 through 8. What do we learn in this? So, let me give you a, a slight idea of what's going on here. Let's see if I've got it up here. Do, 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 do. See, oh no, really? Right here. See this little town? Anybody know what that is? Jerusalem. All right, so the disciples are waiting. Jesus has died. He's been resurrected, and they're waiting, right? They're, they're doing what they were told, and they're in the upper room, and they're waiting, and they're like, man, what do we do now? Our king died. We thought he was bringing this kingdom, and like, what now? Can you imagine their disbelief and sorrow? And, and then Jesus shows up. Okay, he went to the road to Emmaus, he met with the two disciples, and then he comes, and, and Peter and, and John had seen the empty tomb, and, and Mary and Martha, and he, he's running back, or they run back, and they tell him he's alive, and they're like, what? And then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. And so they're in Jerusalem, right here. So you saw the road to Emmaus, they were walking there, and then Jesus shows up over here. And so you've got Judea. Samaria, and then the rest of the known world. And the, so that's what Jesus was just explaining to them. First in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then to the ends of the what? The earth. So let's look at this and see exactly what this means. Jesus is with the disciples in verse 4 and tells them to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now, isn't that interesting that he tells us in Matthew 28, baptize. And we learn that the baptism is not just water, but also the what? Holy Spirit. And now he tells them to what? Wait on the Holy Spirit. In verse 5, we see that there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let me read it to you. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So now Jesus confirms that believers should be and will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now let me ask you something. Do you believe the early church were able to raise the dead, heal the sick, speak in tongues? Do you think they were able to heal and, and do all of these miracles... If they weren't baptized in the Spirit? No. So the early church was absolutely baptized in the Spirit. And again, I go back. You wonder why you're not using the spiritual gifts God gave you? It's because you've not been baptized in the Spirit and you've been holding back. But now we see Jesus say, you will be baptized in the Spirit. So Christian, I'm asking, what, what's holding you back? Why are you holding back? Why are you stopping this baptism in the Lord? And I've got one word, and it starts with five letters. You want to know why? Pride. Because we're unwilling to let go of self. We're unwilling to not be in control. Because what happens when you're not in control? It's kind of what? Scary? But aren't we fooling ourselves when we think we're in control? We're not really in control, are we? We're not. So let go, and as Jesus says, be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, Therefore, hey, didn't we just learn that word? He says in verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they came together because of what Jesus just did. Because of Jesus' power and authority. They go do what they do. Do you see that? Because of Jesus' power and authority, they're baptized in the Spirit. Because of Jesus' power and authority, <clears throat> they go. Because of Jesus' baptism or Jesus' power and authority, they go and teach the nations. Because of who? Do you see the central focus? It's not you. It's not me. It's not our church. Who's the central focus of all of this? Jesus. Pride has kept many of us from putting Jesus as the central person focus of our lives. 
You wonder why we're not, you're not seeing change? It's because Jesus isn't first in your life. And that's most likely because of pride. So, we keep moving down these verses. In verse 8. In verse 8 it says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. We see this idea. This shall be is the first person verb. Literally meaning, I will be. So you can read this as I will be receiving power when the Holy Spirit comes on me. Friends, guess what? If you don't have the Holy Spirit immersion and the Holy Spirit on you, you don't have power. It is essential that you have the Holy Spirit's power and immersion in your life or nothing will change. Have you ever kept doing the same sin over and over and over and over? And wanted it to change, but you don't stop? Guess what? You don't have the Holy Spirit power on your life. I will be receiving the Holy Spirit power is the way you can read that because it's literally the first person verb. I will, re I will be receiving the Holy Spirit and I will be a witness to Jesus. Can you say, can you say that with confidence that I've received the Holy Spirit power? Can you say with confidence, I'm a witness of Jesus to the world? Can you say with confidence that I am being used by Jesus in the world around me? Jesus commands us that it will happen. Friends, it must happen. If we're going to see change and people get saved, we must have the Holy Spirit power in our lives. And what do we do with that in verse 8? We're witnesses of Jesus. Listen, I've said this numerous times. It is time that you and I get bold with the name of Jesus. The... Here's the thing, when you say God, it could mean a million different things. And if you are afraid to say the name of Jesus, there's something wrong in your heart. There's something going on if you are afraid to say the name of Jesus. With the name of Jesus, the demons bow. At the name of Jesus, the tongues will confess the knees will bow and the world will, will proclaim that Jesus is King. It's not enough to just say, God bless you. Have a good day. That's great. Keep doing that. But say, hey, Jesus loves you. Hey, Jesus died for you. It's not enough to just talk about God and say, God, we understand and know that God came in the flesh in human form as Jesus. Our salvation is in no other name under heaven but Jesus. That's right. Jesus. You see, He says you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. Who's saying this? It's in red letters in verse 8. Jesus. You and I are to be witnesses of Jesus. Let me, let, me give you, let me give you some advice. Let me give you a battle plan. It's so simple. But the demons will try to get you not to do it. When your spouse starts acting in a way that they shouldn't act. Go speak Jesus to them. When your kids start doing things they shouldn't be doing, speak the name of Jesus. When your friend is gossiping, say, would Jesus like this? Speak the name of Jesus. 
I've heard so many people say, God, 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 and I'm not taking away from Yahweh. Trust me, I'm not. But they never say the name of Jesus. And this has been a pet peeve of mine for 18 years of ministry. If you can't say the name of Jesus, there's a problem in your heart. You should be able to boldly and profoundly speak the name Jesus. And let me tell you something. If you get in that situation with your spouse and you start speaking Jesus and they're being controlled by the demons, you need to understand the demons most likely are going to fight back. You can fight those demons in the name of Jesus. I've been in battles before with people in the ministry and situations where I for an hour just spoke the name of Jesus. The people don't even remember what happened in that hour because of the demonic control. But you know what breaks it? Speaking the name of of Jesus. You, f- you see, friends, we're living in a time when our enemy's not scared anymore because the church is not saying the name of Jesus. You're not taking the power and authority that has been given you in Jesus and using it. And so they're not scared of you anymore. They're not scared of your homes. They're not scared of this church. They're starting to get that way, though. And so, you are to be witnesses of Jesus. The death, the burial, the resurrection, what Jesus has done in your life, what you've seen Him do in other people's lives. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. So where? Jerusalem. This is where they're currently assembled. So this is your neighborhood. This is your workplace. This is our neighborhood up here. This is your local area. Our city is our Jerusalem. Does that make sense? So Jesus tells them, start where you are. And and I believe this is a test. If you're not going to be a good steward and and be a witness of Jesus where you're at, God's not going to bless you with any more. He's not going to use you bigger. He's not going to use you more profoundly. He's not going to use you in in bigger ways if you're not willing to to speak Jesus in your local area. Your homes, your neighborhoods, our city. Speak Jesus. Then we go to Judea. And this would be the equivalent of their country as we saw. So guess what, friends? U.S. We should be proclaiming Jesus in the United States of America. Maybe that's going on a week mission trip to an Indian reservation. Maybe that's doing a week uh, mission trip when there's a flood. Maybe that... Whatever. You get the idea. We need to be looking for opportunities to speak Jesus in our country. You. You. Each of you. Don't just look at the pastor in a small group of people and say, that's for you, pastor! Lead them. How about you? Lead. How about you step up? How about you take this mandate seriously? Samaria. This is farther expanding into the known world right around them at the time. This is the idea of Canada, Mexico. And for those that don't know, this is pretty cool because Friday... We're going to go up early. Our flight leaves Saturday and Friday. We're going to go up and we're going to go into Canada. I'm the only one out of all nine of us that's ever been to Canada. So we all got passports, right? So we're going to go into Canada. Guess what? That's our Samaria. Isn't that neat? I guarantee you God's going to use one of us in that group to speak Jesus Friday. And then he concludes with the end of the earth. This is every country, nation, people, tribe, and tongue in the world. 
the name of Jesus must go out. Are we going? Are you and me going to be able to go to everywhere in the world? No, no. But you, you and I should be going somewhere. We should be going somewhere. And and let me say this: Don't be a Christian that just goes. Well, I'm just going to go where it's fun and easy, because that's not really a sacrifice. The idea of this is that you've died to self and you're going to be Jesus to the world. It's not about yourself and your comfort and how easy it is. It's about being Jesus. And so get rid of that idea. I want to go where it's nice and fun and, and, and easy. Because that's you're missing the idea. You're missing the idea if that's what you think mission work is supposed to be. So, now, check this out. This is so cool. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the what? As a what? To all the nations, and then the end will come. You see, Matthew 24 is a chapter all about end times prophecy. Things to happen. And Jesus is explaining, Acts 1, go into all the world as a witness to Him, and when all of the world knows about Jesus, the end will come. You and I are called to help bring about end times events. Did you know that? That when you go into the ends of the earth preaching the gospel, you are helping fulfill prophecy. Did you know that? Isn't that amazing that you can be used in prophetic ways? I think that's pretty amazing. So, where does that leave us this morning? Well, for you... I pray that you've wrestled and, and you saw that you've been called to God's army. You've been called to the Great Commission. The very large authority and power granted to us to preach the gospel as a witness of Jesus everywhere. That you've accepted that. You've believed that. And you'll decide to stop wasting your life. You'll decide not one more day will go by that God will use you in the name of Jesus. That you will be used every day hereafter, including this day, that you'll wake up and Yahweh will say, you're commissioned today in the name of Jesus, and you'll say, I'm going in Jesus' power and authority to proclaim the name of Jesus to the ends of the earth. Lord, use me now. Here I am. Send me. And for me, where does that leave me? Well, that leaves me heading on a jet plane. Did you know, you know that song, We're Leaving on a Jet Plane? I meant to have it queued up and I forgot. Did you know that song was sang by John Denver in like 1964? I didn't know it was John Denver. That's pretty cool. But we're leaving on a jet plane. So, we wanted to leave you with what's, what does this look like? So you understand exactly what it means for a group of nine people from this church to go to Kenya. And, and I'm a, uh, how do I say this? I'm a numbers guy to a certain extent. But I like, I like the old adage, there's the, the proof's in the pudding. I'm a meat and taters guy. How about that? That's better. I, I like seeing what God does. Do you? I, I like knowing what Jesus accomplishes. Amen? Especially when, when I've been entrusted first and foremost by Jesus, and second of all by you as the church, and the, all the people that have donated, I like to, 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 to be transparent. 
I like you to know what God's doing in the name of Jesus. So with that, meat and taters kind of guy I am, I wrote it down. So you know exactly what we're doing. You know what's going to happen. You know where the money's going. And you know how much the name of Jesus is being proclaimed. And so what we've done is we're going to close after communion with a commissioning. We are going to pray over us and over what these suitcases, and I'm going to explain all that in a minute, together as a group up here. And I'm just going to ask you to lay hands on and lay hands on each of us as you send us off in the name of Jesus to do His work. But inside these suitcases is this. We're going to be handing out uh, Bibles, Luo, Swahili, and English. And, and that 2200 is not an accurate cost because by, this is just what we're buying over there. Um, $80 uh, uh, were, were bought here, $80 worth of Bibles. We were donated Bibles. But at this point, we're handing out at least 500 Bibles in country. Three languages. We're putting on three conferences, Pastor Me, Shelly, and Pastor Jay, and we're that the food for that is costing a thousand dollars that the deacons have given, and we're feeding six hundred people that day. You know, just wait till the end. Sorry. Church building. Christian Bro is leading an effort to help build a church. We're sending over fifteen hundred dollars, and we're spending a day or two to build a church for a church that has no structure right now. The conference materials that the women's ministry have donated, um, pins, journals, bracelets, games, is at least $800 worth. There's more than that. Um, 400 pins and journals are going to the pastors and their wives. You all are sending gifts to the pastors and their wives. The kids, we've got 3,000 plus bracelets that we're handing out. Say Jesus loves you. We're handing out gospel tracts. We, all sorts of things. That's not all of it. That's just some of it, guys. Feeding. We're going to be feeding um, at a conference and revival a thousand people for twenty six hundred dollars. That we're going to be feeding at least a thousand people. And we're going to be preaching in an el in elementary schools, high schools, colleges. And many, many open air crusades, and for banners and a PA system, and, and all that stuff that it entails to make that happen, is is 880 bucks. That's a snapshot of two weeks in Kenya. Now, the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that are going to get saved, priceless. Priceless. In one short year, Jesus has raised the money for all of that and to send the nine of us halfway across the world. And so, I just want to thank you and ask you to pray for us. The responsibility that is involved with this is unbelievable. And Jesus has worked out so much. So many logistics. So many things. I told the team a couple occasions, I said, you know the Lord's in the middle of this. Organizing all this is not my strong suit and it's all just fallen into place. And so I just ask you to pray for us. And I thank you from the depths of my soul, the deepest parts of my heart, 
And please, please, please stay tuned to the Sunrise page. Because there's going to be so many videos and pictures of what Jesus is doing. Y'all will want to just proclaim what, what Jesus is doing. And I can't wait till we get back and share the transformation in our lives and in the people that God's putting in our path. So, I thank you. And I'm humbled that the Lord has allowed me to go in His stead as a representative of this church and proclaim Jesus Christ. So we're going to do communion and then we're going to pray. Um, there's all, all those Bibles, except for like 136 of them, are in these suitcases. Those pens, those papers, the journals, food that we're taking with us for snacking materials and things like that. All that stuff is in these suitcases. The way the Lord's worked that out is absolutely amazing. So we're going to pray over all this and commission it after we get done with communion. But before we do that, I would be remiss if I did not offer you the opportunity to come up here and get on your knees and ask the Lord how you are being commissioned. Ask Jesus how He wants to use you in His service. In your homes, in your workplaces, in your neighborhoods, in your city, in the state, in the country, in this continent, and around the world. I just beg you to come ask the Lord how He's going to use you and wants to use you. And if you've never been immersed in the Holy Ghost, you've never been baptized in the Spirit and in fire, then I beg you to start that process. I beg you to start that process now. I'm going to pray and open the altar. Lord God, we love you. We praise you. We ask your forgiveness, Lord. We are sinners. We do not deserve your grace and mercy. But, oh, Father, how we thank you. Lord, open the doors to greater commissionings in this church, Lord. Open the doors to greater callings. Open the door, Father, to greater uh, surrender of this church, Lord. I pray for those that have never been baptized in the Spirit and fire that, Lord, they would decide today to, to, to start that process and, and surrender to You, Father. Lord, get rid of pride. Get rid of selfishness. Lord, get rid of us doing things. And let Your Spirit have His way now. As we open this altar, Father, we ask Your Spirit to move. We ask Your Spirit to do His work. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, and everybody prayed and said amen.